Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming for this very important talk. Uh, we are very privileged to have Professor Sainath with us here again. Um, and today's talk is a talk that will be uh, dealing with some a very crucial, a very critical issue. Uh, it's dealing with the a, a large section of our country's population for a sector in which almost 60 to 70 percent of India's population live and work on uh, the, agri the agricultural sector. And we all know that, that the sector has been going through some distress and a, and a severe crisis for a long time now. So this talk, the aim of having this talk, the idea of having this talk is to understand, to explore why is it that this crisis persists? Why is it that this crisis started in the first place? So I couldn't think of anyone better than Professor San, um, P. Sainath, who has worked extensively on this eight, on this area to deliver the, the talk. Uh, so I'll briefly introduce what the talk will be about. In the media and in popular discourse, terms like distress, farm crisis, and ag agrarian crisis are often used interchangeably. In fact, these are things which we need to ponder how and why. The crisis devastating both farming and the larger agricultural communities has been raging now for well over two decades. Millions of livelihoods have been lost, millions more greatly diminished. The best known aspect of the tragedy has been undoubtedly the death by suicide of close to four lakh farmers. But appalling as they are, the suicides are not e equivalent to the crisis they are its saddest and most tragic manifestation. Nor was this crisis the result of drought or floods or any other natural calamities. It was, and it continues to be driven by human agency, primarily by a set of economic policies and pathways, which India introduced and entrenched in its policies since 1991 a path that has led to greater and greater corporate control over agriculture and what subsequently led to the massive farmer protest that we witnessed in the, in the last two years. And an interesting part about this topic, just to give a brief side note of that, since Professor Sainath has been reporting on this issue for a very long time, in 2007, his reporting had led him uh, to being asked to address both houses of Parliament by the then Speaker Somnath Chatterjee. But as we have realized that uh, his talk ha has the, the insight which he gave to the policymakers at that time still hasn't translated into effective action. And with today's talk, we will try to explore why is it that, that, that it has worked out and what can be the way forward out from this point. So I uh, ask all of you to join me in welcoming Professor Sainath with a huge round of applause. You know, uh, let's begin with what the very first line of what uh, Ashish told you. The very first line of what Ashish told me. If you look at the media, and by the way, I find that uh, academics also make this error of using agricultural crisis and agrarian crisis interchangeably, they are not the same. And rural India is not only about agriculture. When the crisis, there was a point at which this was a crisis of agriculture, a crisis in farming. It's gone way beyond that thing. You know, if you look at the, what, what does a farmer earn in this country? Some of you will remember that when the protests were going on at the gates of Delhi, a lot of experts, think tank people, etc., wrote attack, including India's director on the IMF, Professor Surjit Balla wrote attacking the farmers, saying they are demanding socialism for rich farmers. 
Yeah. Remember that? So what do what does a farmer earn for us to declare that they are rich? There is there is data for that. In fact, there's a relatively new data set on that. There are every every now and then, every few years, the National Sample Survey does a uh, round, an agriculture round, situation assessment of farm households included. 2013 and 2018 are what happened in the last decade. The surveys in farming. The 70th round of NSS and the 77th round of NSS. Income of agricultural households. Uh, what do you think is the average income of the farm household in this country? We don't have individual farmer incomes, we have households. Household varies from 4.3 in some states to 5.4 in Punjab and 5.9 in Haryana. Very high numbers of uh, family members in farm households. So what do you think? These are supposed to be the rich farmers, right? I mean, lots of editorials were written. Don't pan look, nobody else is there. Don't pander to these guys. They're rich farmers. What does a farmer earn in the country? What is the farm household earning? Take a shot, make your bid, make your guess. It is, again, I'm saying this is household income. All members of the family. It includes the income from cultivation. It includes the cult in income from wage labor because 80% of 90% of farmers in this country can't survive on what they, on what their tiny tract of land produces. They do wage labor elsewhere. Okay. And the third major source is livestock. And then you have you know, salaries and other things, because there are people living in the farm household who may be uh, doing a local job. But what is that farm household? You give me a monthly figure, because that's how they calculated it for you. And in 2013, that was for a family, family of minimum, I mean, average family of five, the national average income of a farm household in 2013 was 6,426 rupees. Okay. 6,426 rupees per month. Right? Then, remember that a government comes along which makes three promises and wins an election on those promises. It says, within 12 months of being elected, we will implement the Swaminathan Commission report. This is in some 73 speeches made by Mr. Modi we will implement the Swaminathan Commission report in 12 months of being elected. The Swaminathan Commission report is actually a wrong name. The actual name of it is National Commission for Farmers report, of which the most distinguished Dr. M. S. Swaminathan was the chair. And uh, so you had and they had way back in 2004 to 2006 drawn what remains, drawn up what remains, the only thing approaching a blueprint for agriculture in India. 
not just looking at the problem, but what could be, what are the pathways, what are the ways of going about it. It was a report drawn up with an enormous amount of consultation with farmers through their farm unions, through farm representation. So this really, in fact, if there are two English words that every farmer in the country will be able to tell you, it's Swaminathan report. You can go to Tanjavur, you can go to the Thar Desert in Rajasthan. They, the farmer knows Swaminathan report because they wanted it, they identified it. And that's where, contrary to common belief, it wasn't just about MSP. But it was one of the most important recommendations. It wasn't the first, but it was a very important recommendation. So another promise the government made, famous, most famous promise of all, made by the prime minister himself, what was that? In five years' time, do guna badaiga. Kisan kai. Income of the farmer, we will double. They made that promise in 17, 16, 17, when Mr. Arun Jaitley was still alive to make promises. So these were the promises made then. And implementing of the Farm Commission report, uh, Swami Nathan report, it didn't take 12 months. In the first two, within two months, of the government being elected. They filed an affidavit in the Supreme Court saying it cannot be done. It's unrealistic. It would distort the markets. Somehow, what it did to the markets was more important than what it was doing to 95 million Indian farmers. It cannot be, they filed an affidavit, I think in the first month almost. It cannot be done. We will not do it. After having won an election on the promise with millions of farmers' votes. The second thing that happened was the doubling of income in five years. The 2018-19 NSS, 77th round, what, does it show a doubling of farmers' income? Well, it shows about 10,000 rupees per household and immediately adjusted for inflation, it comes to about a, and adjusted for real wage, real income, it comes to about 8,000, 8,032 rupees or 8,232 rupees. Now here's the nub. Not only did you not double the income, you actually lowered it in a very important sense because Puzzling. Remember, I said there are three sources of the income. One is agriculture, cultivation. One is wage labor. And the third is livestock. Now, this marginal increase between 2013 and 2018 reports, that increase came from a big increase in wage labor which meant that more and more farmers were having to work outside of their farms to be able to pull by, to be able to get by. More and more farmers were working off, off farm. And another area where it went up was livestock. Hmm. And that, is a, that has a very dangerous trend and implication, the livestock for one thing. Because the livestock census of India, 19, 2009, shows us that there continues to be a precipitous fall in deshi livestock. Three kinds of things are very badly. Small animals are disappear, I mean, are falling in population very badly. Who keeps small animals? Poorer people. I mean, who keeps pigs? Who keeps, you know, uh, goats? Who keeps sheep? Smaller animals are kept by poorer people. And 
deshi cows are kept by poorer people that is what what in our wisdom we call non descript species you know, just because you don't know what it is you you club it into a thing called non descript species so it also be it shows in indigenous cattle varieties with the worshippers of the cow in power indigenous cattle varieties have plummeted and they have plummeted in every livestock census since the dawn of our new economic policy path in 1990 ever till then everything is increasing everything is increasing but from 2000 onwards if the livestock census is meant to be had every 5 years we didn't do that because the numbers were so bad that it was delayed for another 2 3 years on the excuse that the surveyors have not learned how to use the new tabs we have given them so it took the surveyors 3 years to learn the new tabs apparently how to use the tablets and then they did this but even more scary the increase in wage wages money income from wage labor means that more and more farmers are seeking out work outside their farm and more and more of them are competing with landless agricultural laborers okay so the pressure on that is much more it will not lead to a rise in wages right it's going to lead to a lowering of that real wage for people in the countryside everywhere agricultural income declined it actually declined the very thing that was supposed to have doubled actually declined there are various ways of looking at it but it's between 4 and 8% decline so you came to power saying i'll double the income of farmers in 5 years and you manage to lower the income from agricultural income from cultivation only the um, steep rise in wage labor income and some rise in livestock income raised it but uh, okay first thing what was the difference between the farm crisis and agrarian crisis anyone like to take a shot at that you guys are supposed to be studying these things what's the difference between agriculture and agrarian farm crisis and agrarian yes so which kind of people that's very good uh, that's a very good answer but i'm saying which kind of people do you mean you mean farmers that's excellent a farm crisis is that of the cultivator and the agriculture agrarian society is much larger than cultivators and you'd be that's a very good answer and you'd be surprised how many uh, highly respected global economists don't know the damn difference between farmer and agrarian in this country including two of whom we shall shortly look at uh the agriculture when we talk about as she says you are talking about cultivation agrarian includes a hell of a lot more people than farmers and in greater numbers than there are farmers uh, who are dependent on the agricultural economy that will include your you know that will include even your weavers potters all of whom depend on the agrarian 
agricultural economy. This larger circle, that is your agrarian society. Kumbhars, Julahas, uh, farm labor, landless workers, all of them come into that larger agrarian thing. Now there are lots. So, you know, when, when we conflate these or act as if they're one, it leads to one of the most common stereotypes of Indian uh, society. What percentage of our, uh, what percentage of Indians are farmers? Fifty. No, that you know the, the government is the government is bullshitting you. They know very well what a farmer is and how it's defined in the census. Okay. And the time period is 180 days or more. That person is a full fledged farmer. If you have been working 180 days, your income, if you've been working in farming for 180 days, it means that that is the primary source of your income. More than six months. It means that's the primary source. The person who earns between, uh, who is working between three and six months in farming, that person is called, in the person who's full-time, I recognize as full-time is over 180 days. That person is called main cultivator in the census. The person who is working three to six months or less than six months, that person is called marginal cultivator in the census. This is not a reference to size of land holding, but a reference to you're not getting your dominant or primary income from farming. So the margin, are you clear? Yeah. So if we look uh, in the days when I was establishing the figures on how many people had died, how many people had um, The two Columbia Dons, Don Bhagwati and Arvind Panagaria, wrote a book, you know, celebrating 70 years of Indian independence or whatever it was, in which they attacked this whole nonsense of farm suicides and said the rate of suicides of farmers in India is extremely low. I'm, I'm quoting them because consider that 53% of Indians are farmers. That is the figure, you're right. They gave 53% of Indians are farmers. What's 200,000 suicides? At that time, it was 2 lakh, okay, 10 years ago. So it was, what is 2 lakh suicide on a 53% of the population? It's nothing. First, the morality of that, it means that Bhopal gas tragedy was nothing. Bhopal gas tragedy was 20,000 people on a population then of 800 million. It's statistically negligible. You know, the second thing is that uh, Don Bhagwati and Sancho Panagaria don't know who, what, how a farmer is defined in India and what is this? Because all these books are put together as quickies with their interns and researchers, right? Happens all the time. So they, they write there that 53% of Indians being farmers, the less than 8% of Indians are farmers. Less than 8%, I'm telling you, that 180 days and more main cultivator, and it will be hugely, it's been falling every year, every census since 1991. When we took a path of development that has proved to be very hostile to the farmer. 
1990, if you look at the census, 61, 71, 81, 91, the number of farmers is increasing. There's the green revolution. More people are coming onto it. There's more subdivision of land. There are more farmers. 2001, 2011, and whenever we get this present census, the number of farmers have been plummeting. Less than 8% of your society are main cultivators. Then that marginal cultivator, if you get those numbers and add it, you come to a 9.8% or the 10 that they're talking about. Then if we take full-time agricultural laborers, marginal, you know, main workers, agricultural labor, marginal workers, agricultural labor, you're coming to another 20. Um, and you add those to add those to these two, you're coming to about 24, 25%. Yeah. But the farm suicides were calculated until the NCRB was forced to change its methodology. It was calculated on the 8% on the full status farmer, on the full time farmer. So 200,000 suicides on 8% of the fam of the population gives you a very different ratio from uh, then from 53%. The person who actually I worked with who cracked all these codes and signaling is Professor K. Nagaraj, retired from the Madras Institute of Development Studies, to my mind, the greatest authority on agrarian data. And I mean, he made that data talk and walk. I collected the data one way or the other, got it out of the National Crime Records Bureau. Uh, all those reports also made the National Crime Bureau go public on its website. So there you are. Let me now just given you something of those numbers, the stories. In two, see, there were a few suicides here and there in 2000, 98, 99, when it started. We thought, most of us thought, it's a bad year. We had seen that before. We had seen bad cycles where people take their lives. Then it, it kept, so you have reports, two farmers take their lives, two farmers, Commit suicide, which is a bad word, by the way. I don't think we should be saying commit. Commit seems like a crime. You commit murder, you commit arson. Commit suicide, you actually, you've, you've committed no crime against anyone else. Yeah. So I think we should just be saying ended their lives or took their own lives and things like that. The in 2001, I got a call from the finest rural reporter in the country, ML Narasimha Reddy of Inadu, who is today, that time a very young reporter, now the bureau chief everywhere for Inadu, based in Hyderabad. His exact words were, come soon, something terrible is happening in the countryside. So I caught the next train. Those days we had to take train still. I was only a freelancer. Went to Anantapur in Rayalaseema. In Anantapur, the day we arrived, the chief minister was making a state statement in the legislature. Mr. Naidu, the great Mr. celebrated Mr. Chandra Babu Naidu who fancied his title, he wouldn't call himself chief minister, called himself CEO of Andhra Pradesh, uh, and made a statement that in the suicides by farmers in the state, numbered 54. The number of suicides 
put out by the district crime records bureau okay by the way you can interrupt me at any time from here on so that, you know you don't have to wait for a thing at the end you can we can go according to what you are narsima and i were looking at district crime record bureau figures of 632 in the single district of anantapur in rajasthan so how did they get these differing numbers went to the police stations at the ground the, the basic units of the police station looked at the fir's looked at the reports looked at the investigators thing but we weren't getting anywhere so they said okay the cops told us okay this village had three suicides this year so far that village had two in the last 6 months so 14 15 villages we went to and you go there and tell people okay this village had two suicides in the last 6 months they laugh you the hell out of the village they say what what crap are you talking and they they used much stronger words that crap uh they said what are you talking 11 people have committed suicide here in the last 3 months and we expect and we know that at least 5 6 more will do so this month it didn't fit then we went to the next village two suicides in the last 6 months turns out to have been 21 in the previous year two two twin villages and this goes on and on and on then we look at the district crime records bureau again and see the you know all academics i said this in earlier meetings always before you rush into using data with great eagerness and enthusiasm just try picturing in your head the guy who put together that data on the ground in this case a bunch of cloth headed cops how that how that data is constructed is miraculous so in the district crime records bureau there are five or six categories of cause of suicide mode of suicide cause of suicide i would advise anyone looking at this to take the mode of suicide seriously and for god's sake don't even waste any time on the cause of suicide as determined by the investigator and the police that will be a tehsildar will go if there is a big political situation the collector will go visit it once etc so do you, would you believe we found that yeah okay the numbers match but not in the way we thought in the causes of suicide worldwide there are four five basic causes of suicide okay one is uh, very common is marital discord and uh, bankruptcy you know impoverishment uh, for students it is failure in exams but that happens once a year twice a year though it gets a lot more attention than farmer suicide uh and then there was those causes usually account for 30 40% of suicides anywhere they accounted for 2.5% of suicides in anantapur so where did all the other suicides go in that column so beloved of data and economists guys others call up suddenly we found 60.5% of all suicides in anantapur were under other causes so back to the police station back to the villages checking the causes back to the police station reopened the fir's and so what were those other causes the single biggest cause as listed by the police suicide due to unbearable stomach ache 
six hundred of them in Anantapur over a two-year period. Suicide due to un any Telugu people here? Pottanoppi, Kadupunoppi. Suicide due. Now, what they did? You see, it's not that there was a conspiracy. Okay, there was no. I mean, that's how bureaucracy is very often. In one particular politically sensitive case, the DIG or someone would have said, "Oh, I know that fellow. He was next to my house. He's a drunkard. You know, he he. You know, I know him. He was going to kill himself. And uh, you know, see, what did you find? You found thousand. Yeah, you he had a. He must have had a terrible stomachache with all that drinking, and took the poison. It was actually inverting the process." On its head. What was the process? The stomach cake was the outcome, not the cause. If you take, if you drink pesticide, I promise you, you will have a very bad stomach cake. Though I also promise you, it will be your last. Okay. So these people, ground down by the crisis, took their lives by consuming. Why? Do you know that more than four fifths of all farmers' suicides are done using pesticides? Now, if you take homemakers or housewives, as they put it, more often than not, that will be hanging. Why is the farmer taking? Why is the farmer killing himself or herself with pesticide? Because the input is there, right and ready on their farm, in their in their shed, it's available then and there. A hell of a lot of farmers' suicides happen in the September October spraying season. You're there with your can of pesticide. One moment of misery or depression, you're gone. There's no river. You can see there's a huge spike in that period when the cotton spraying happens. Whenever there is spraying happening, it's very, it's very, very risky, and it's lives are. Yes, it is in in cotton. Yes, but I'm saying even otherwise, the spraying is what. What? Anantapur is largely groundnut, but again, it the the distinction is not BD non BD. The dist first distinction is. Cash crop, food crop. If you want to look at where the suicides are greater, they are overwhelmingly in cash crop. They happen in in Punjab. You have to remember that rice paddy is a cash crop in Punjab. It's not really made for grown for consumption that much. So this is uh, the where where we were saying. Okay, the we found that they had. All these lives we reconstructed about fifty-three of them in fifty-three households, and we found what the causes were, which were very understandable and logical. And all of them had taken their lives by consuming pesticide. Monocrotophos was the chosen pesticide because that the government of Andhra Pradesh had distributed free of charge because Seba Gaji. Was trying to gain a foothold in Andhra Pradesh. Monocroto, it was distributing large quantities of monocroto for the government, free. So it was a free input for people already reeling under doubt. You took that and you took it. That's what happened. Then we started understanding the scale at what was going on. Yeah. In the next five years, we did. I did about one hundred and fifty reports from the countryside, looking at credit, input costs, looking at uh, pest uh, pesticide, looking at poison deaths versus hanging deaths. Between then and two thousand eighteen, I visited for my sins. Nine hundred households where there had been suicides, and I saw how they are categorized. I was present when the tehsildar or the head constable came. The process, 
these 400,000 suicides are nothing compared to the actual reality. Eight groups of people are excluded from these numbers. The first huge group of farmers being excluded from the suicide numbers in very large, not completely excluded, I mean, largely overwhelming. Who would that be? Which group of farmers would that be? Sorry? Women farmers. Women farmers, because women, we don't accept them as farmers in our country. Incidentally, we are, they are farmers' wives or farmers' daughters. Women, 65% of all labor in agriculture in this country is done by women. 65%. I don't think it's ever been less than 60%. Yeah. But here's the thing. People tell me in ag agonized, sir, but labor participation, work participation rate of women is falling. Yeah. yeah, sure. Because we don't calculate unpaid work hours in the GDP. We don't calculate women's unpaid labor. Worldwide, women and adolescent girls in just the care sector alone they do 12.5 billion unpaid working hours every single goddamn day of the year. That amount, I'm giving you ILO and Oxfam figures, that amount totals $10.8 trillion of unpaid work annually, $10.8 trillion of unpaid work annually by women and adolescent girls. Okay. There are millions of chores that they do, which we don't, we don't see as work because it's not paid for. If it's not paid for, it's, not, it's in the, if it's paid for, it will be recorded as economic activity and will go into your GDP. If it's, tell me how many of you have ever seen, for instance, one of these activities, which has gigantic value, cash value, but which you will never find in your GDP. How many men, have you ever seen collecting cow dung? How often have you seen a man collecting cow dung? Have you, Manoj? Hmm? That's women's work, right? Now, do you know what happens? It's free, right? The work, the, it's, it's free. The cow dung that women collect in this country saves you a billion dollars or more in fuel imports. It's been the National Institute of Science, others have tried making estimates five, six times. It's too widespread a phenomenon to get a proper fix. But we know that at the very least, it's tens of millions of dollars annually. Okay? Tens of millions of dollars annually. Now, it doesn't get cut. That's a that's a contribution to GDP. Otherwise, you'd be importing fossil fuels, hastening climate crisis, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There is, but cow dung, alas, is not listed on the stock exchange. Cow dung is not listed on the stock exchange, though a lot of bullshit is. Maybe it's a gender thing, girls. You know, cow dung versus bullshit, <laughs> and. Priority, of course, given to the male. Yeah, so, $10.8 trillion of unpaid work by women and children every year. You know how big $10.8 trillion is? It is bigger than the entire global IT sector. And it is three times the value of the top 10 tech firms. Oh, yeah, top 10 tech firms. That's next time you see a woman collect dung, remember that, okay? It's work. It's just unpaid work. Okay, so women farmers are excluded from the list in large numbers. Um, 
Then Dalit farmers, usually they are sitting on redistributed land. Government. Society will never accept them as farmers. No. Adivasis are encroachers. You know, they're in, they've been encroaching that land for 10,000 years, but they're encroachers. You know, a state that came 75 years ago is the defender of the land. So Adivasi uh, farmers' suicides tend to get much. You'll find all of them represented, but in much smaller numbers than they are really happening. That's because of, again, I don't blame the NCRB for that. There's no conspiracy. That's your society. That's your society. I mean, until 2014, the errors of the NCRB were errors of omission. From 2014, we add errors of commission. In fact, from 2011, and your state, Chhattisgarh, is one of the first. So as I did these stories and we kept bringing out, uh, that was when I was called to parliament by uh, Somnath Chatterjee. He had a speaker's lecture series. The first speaker was Amartya Sen, second was MS Swaminathan. And for some reason, they asked me to be the third. So we, when we, we started looking at that, if the NCRB is saying 200,000, 400,000, it's going to be a hell of a lot worse. Then we started really doing every, every day, N Ram of the Hindu was one editor willing to front page rural stories. So when we started damaging them every day, Governments, all the state governments started reacting. The DGP of Chhattisgarh of that time in 2011 rang up and had an argument with me. And the man did not know. He said, where is this data from? I said, it's your data, my dear. He didn't know that it, how, he didn't know how NCRB data is collated. It comes from every police tana in the country sending it to the District Crime Records Bureau. Every District Crime Records Bureau sends it to the State Crime Records Bureau. It's all nationally collated and formatted at the National Crime Records Bureau. The NCRB guys, unko koi lena dena nahi hai usme. They've got no stake in that. So they're not actively distorting anything. It's coming with all our societal prejudices, exclusions, which reflect in every other sphere of Indian life. Why should we be surprised that they reflect in the counting of Suicides or farmers' suicide. Right. So that's that's the next thing that happened. And um, the um, give you one example what the exclusion does. Which do you guys think is the which do you guys think is the worst, is the best place in India to be a farmer? For a woman, to be a woman farmer, which is the best, which is the best part of India to be a woman farmer? If we go by farm suicide numbers, paradise for women farmers is Punjab and Haryana. Why would that be? Can you tell me? Those were smart answers, you tell me. They don't accept women as farmers. Yeah. In the same Punjab Haryana list, if you look at general suicides category, women's numbers are exploding because you've taken hundreds and thousands over 10 years of women farmers who have taken their lives and put them in it's essentially a bunch of fitting corpses to columns. So this is how you are. Anyway, but the crisis, what was the crisis about? All these were manifestations. In 1991, in 1991, we chose a new path of development and a market-friendly path of development. Okay? 
the worship of the market as if it is some autonomous god like entity with no bias no favor nothing of the sort from then we we started a credit squeeze of the farmers when you keep hearing about waivers loan waivers please know that there was no loan waiver in the last 50 years preceding the crisis there was one loan waiver of 10000 rupees after a terrible drought and that was declared by choudhury devi lal as deputy prime minister of the country a farmers leader nor do you find anywhere farmers asking for loan waivers it all starts from the 90s because we took away agricultural credit from the farmers there used to be two kinds of credit broadly given by banks there's a priority sector lending a priority sector lending where banks are compelled mandated to give a percentage to the rural india 40% within that agriculture 18% whatever okay every year dear old pranab da and then even there are old chidambaram redefined priority sector every year okay they redefined what is the priority sector until more farmers more non farmers as of today more non farmers are getting agricultural credit than farmers yeah your krishi kendras all of them started being accepted as there used to be two things called direct finance indirect finance direct finance was the credit you gave directly to the farmer indirect finance was what you gave to other agencies co-ops with etc in the idea that it will come back they started broadening the indirect finance so much that indirect finance overtook direct finance in sheer embarrassment the reserve bank of india in 2013 merge the two it removed the distinction between direct and indirect payments so you couldn't know who was getting how much until uh, though there are terrific uh, studies done by you should call him professor ramakumar of this who started showing us what how they are doing this the way they are doing it that was the game then comes uh, so the credit okay let me put that in simple english let's say maharashtra is a very large state okay 120 130 million human beings according to the census 55% of maharashtra is rural okay and it's a large farming state guess what share of agricultural credit laid out by nabard you all know nabard national bank agricultural blah blah nabard makes a credit linked potential plan every potential linked credit plan every year and all scheduled commercial banks um, operate on that do their outlays on that basis guess where the money goes in maharashtra 53% of all agricultural credit not rural credit specifically agricultural credit 53% of all agricultural credit in maharashtra goes to mumbai city there are no agriculturists in mumbai city but there is agri business there is monsanto mehiko rasi seeds so you are actually diverting the credit meant for the farmer to the corporate world okay so here and now i'm going to give you agrarian crisis in five words in five words corporate hijack of indian agriculture number 1 what is the process by which that is achieved five words predatory commercialization of the countryside what is the outcome of that five words the greatest greatest displacement in our history that's what it has caused you know during the pandemic 
when people started going home in millions, there was a lot of bleeding heart. Why are they leaving? What will they do there? You know, actually a lot of that bleeding heart came from the fact that we were losing our dobis, our malis, our drivers, all our cheap labor, we were losing it. It was a wrong question. Why are they going back? The real question was, why did they leave the village and come here in the first place? And you only in 2020 April, you become aware of how many migrants there are in the cities. Though the census has told you 432 in, in, in million Indians are migrants. So that the answer for that, why did they leave the villages and come? Two words, agrarian crisis. After we became market friendly, we released. Prices would no longer be contained. You released market on market-based prices. Cultivation costs went up 500 to 700%. 500 to 700%. I mean, depending on the crop, the seed, etc. Seed costs, and I'm talking about some specific areas, but there is no place where it went up less than 300%. Seed, you know, um, natural seed, which in cotton, which you take out from the fleece, was being bought in 1991 in the markets of Yavatmal at 9 rupees a kilogram. But by the way, with the high coming of hybrids in the Green Revolution, a packet of seeds started costing 150, 180 rupees. Hybrid seeds. By 1991, by 2001, the hybrid seed packets were costing um, 350 rupees. Not for a kilogram, for 450 grams. Why would anyone have such a crazy figure of 450 grams? Because all our efforts were for American companies and 450 grams makes one pound. Otherwise, why would you have why would you have a measure like uh, 450 grams? Anyway, 450 grams. Seven, then comes BT. BT comes. It comes at between 1600 rupees for 450 grams and 1800 rupees. 1800 rupees for 450 grams means 4000 rupees per kilogram. For a people who were cultivating at 9 rupees a kilogram, and mostly people cultivated free because they got the seed from their own fields. From 9 rupees a kilogram to hybrids at 700 rupees, 800 rupees a kilogram to BT, which swept across cotton fields in 2004, it was 4,000 rupees a kilogram. Right? At the same time, prices crashed. The farmers' prices crashed. Right? How did and the prices were completely rigged? By the way, if you look at this country, when farmers get good, you made them, you linked them forcibly to globalization. You 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 railroaded a bunch of subsistence farmers into going in for cash crops, saying you'll get credit if you go for cash crops because. World Bank IMF theory, you go, you grow cash crops that the West will buy, you'll get hard currency dollars, poverty is history. That was the, that was the idea. So they started doing this. Then they, um, the next, take, take one acre of cotton in Vidarbha, center of the largest numbers of farmers' suicide. There are two kinds of cultivation, irrigated and irrigated. In Yavatmal, in Yavatmal 2003-04, when Jaiti Pardikar and I did our first full sweep round of Maharashtra, in Vidarbha particularly, please understand that Vidarbha is a very big place. 11 districts, the five, six districts we are talking about, the crisis districts, Vidarbha is bigger than Punjab. The six districts in crisis are bigger than Kerala. 
So what happens there matters on scale. One acre of unirrigated land growing cotton in 2002, 2003 was 2,500 rupees to uh, 4,000 rupees. Irrigated land, one acre of irrigated land cultivating cotton in 2002 or three was 10,000 rupees to 12,000 rupees. Then what was it? 10 years later in 2014, unirrigated land, 18 to 20,000 rupees per acre, irrigated land, 45,000 rupees and above. Farmers' expenses have grown five times and agricultural income has actually declined. Then, Whenever there was a, you told them globalization is good for you, etc. Whenever there were excellent global prices, the government of India puts a ban on cotton exports because the Bombay textile lobby wants that cotton at cheap rates. So they, they never they, they never got the benefit of that so-called globalization. In fact, at that point, I came to conclude and I wrote that. What's happening is globalization of prices and Indianization of incomes. That's what was happening to the farm. Input costs, direct and indirect finance, coffee prices collapsing the way they did. Then huge switches to meet a two season need in the West. Like for instance, in Kerala, suddenly, Vanilla was the most important thing in the world. Kerala, which had a cash crop economy for 200 years, but suddenly everybody was growing vanilla. I go there and I ask my own friends, one acre, two acre farmers, what the hell are you doing? They said, they just told me to FO. They said, you don't know the prices we are getting. We are getting um, 4,000 rupees per kilogram. Now, all that had happened was that the United States, which is the vanilla nation of the world, 68% of all consumption of vanilla, it gets its vanilla from Mexico and Brazil. Frost had killed the crop in Mexico and Brazil. They needed urgently, all these guys who call themselves vanilla federation, vanilla manufacturers, they're not manufacturers, they're traders. Everything that is manufactured or made, is made in the third world, these crops. You can't grow pepper in Alaska, nor coffee in the Yukon. Only we are stupid enough to try growing paddy in Burma. Because the subsidy structure favors rice and paddy. Right? So then, the, they were giving them 4,000 rupees per kilogram for vanilla. Everybody got into it, and also people got into it in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Madagascar, Maldives. Everyone was, everyone and his grandparents were growing vanilla. So there was a fantastic price. The magazines and newspaper cover stories, Karshaga Shri, Man, uh, Malayanam Manorama's agriculture magazine, Vanilla Karod Patis. I found, or I found that. Three of the nine or ten took their lives subsequently. Everybody started building beautiful houses, sending their daughters in Vyanar to private nursing colleges in Mangalore because it's very difficult to get into nursing colleges in Kerala. That's, they produce quality. So then suddenly, I, I kept begging my friends. I said, this is a temporary thing. What happens when Brazil and Mexico re-enter the field? These guys will screw you. 2004, the 4,000 rupees a kilogram, by the way, was $100 a kilogram. At that time, 40 rupees to a dollar. Dollar ka value. Except as my junior in JNU, Dr. Nirmala Sitaraman says, 
the rupee isn't weakening the dollar is strengthening yeah so oh dear it's an embarrassment to a great institution really uh the you know what the price came to in can anyone take a guess from 4000 rupees a kilogram what was the price per kilogram by may 2004 Hundred and sixty-eight rupees a kilogram. That, my dears, is not a price fluctuation; it's an annihilation. This happens in crop after crop, cash crop after cash crop, and India is busily engaged for twenty years in shifting large areas of food crop to cash crop. You have taken a large number of. What I'm trying to tell you is that your agricultural, agrarian crisis is policy driven. human agency driven then you you have unbelievable you have deadly input costs you have exploding credit problems you have a huge credit squeeze which means that tens of millions of farmers move back to the sahukar whose the sahukar the money lenders power in india declined in the 80s in the 70s and 80s because of the bank nationalization because of you know there could have been no increase the increased production we credit to the green revolution actually happened because millions of farmers were for the first time getting credit in their lives bank nationalization saw the maximum number of bank branches come up in rural areas and for the first time at least that middle to lower middle peasant was accessing credit and therefore you have an explosion in production then so you have that that credit squeeze and as more and more farmers go back to the money lender more and more farmers take their own lives in incidentally understand there are money lenders and there are money lenders the crisis is so great i only given you fragments of it okay because we don't have the time the crisis is so great that i have come across small money lenders taking their own lives dying by suicide yeah it makes perfect sense to me a small that um, a small money lender sources his money from the village he sources his money from someone a bigger money lender in the town who gets his capital from someone bigger in a small city or big city or whatever that big money lender about 30% of his capital is out in the market a small money lender in the village 100% of his capital is lent out every paisa of his capital so if you are if your client commits suicide or runs away or migrates to some other place you are dead may as well be so even now understand how your society is linked the first suicides and the agrarian crisis were not farmers they were weavers the weavers of pochampalli remember 91 of them in 91 74 of them in 91 the for the indian traditional weaver you are looking puzzled the indian traditional weaver the farmer and the farmer laborer farm is that is their first market they produce that soft white cloth which by late 90s is completely replaced by chinese and thai fake benetton t-shirts right and we are encouraging that process we have removed import duties on cotton completely all sorts of things are right so then you will find that weavers in pochampalli ansaris in up start taking them they getting deeper and deeper into debt the weavers are smashed today by the way in your state of tamil nadu do you know there is not a single tamilian weaver involved in the making of the kanjivaram sari they are all padmashalis from telangana because the tamil weaver has given up Tamil Nadu has higher living standards than Telangana. They can't maintain those living standards on what they're earning from weaving, so they've moved out. Arni, Kanjivaram, all these things are now Telugu-speaking weavers from 
who are even poorer than these guys are and what has our policy done for those weavers we have reskilled them very great in government of india program on reskilling we have trained them to become auto drivers people with 2000 damn years of skills in their family in their fingers you know they're being given skills to drive an auto rickshaw be a bus conductor wow isn't that amazing so the weavers went the potters went all those depend you know when farmers go bankrupt the mystery the village every village has one or two families of carpenters what happened to them they starved to death because the indian village carpenter the indian village artisan gets most of his income most of his payment is in kind okay so suppose ashish is that carpenter he will he will get 30% of what he is owed by all of us he'll get that in cash the rest of that i'll give him so many kilograms of rice in the year you will give him so many kilograms of tomato we give him some amount of cooked food when the work is on now when the farmer goes bankrupt and no one orders a new plow no one builds a new bullock cart nobody repairs old tools no retooling is done of the old tools the carpenter stop nobody can pay him anything that's how their lives are interlinked that's how their lives are interlinked. okay the honey collector in the forest his or her life is interlinked to this it's around the agricultural economy that's the agrarian all those larger sections so when we went in for all these especially central our credit price crash linking them to the fluctuation of global prices but i noticed that you haven't asked me questions so i invited you to interrupt at any time tell me questions and our people in the earlier stages even and even and our people in earlier stages the suicide is like a stigma the head of the national federation of farmers national association of farmers united states in nebraska gave me an interview where he said i'm receiving messages from my members saying bill i'm going to drive my i'm going to drive my jeep into the harvester combine please ensure that it is declared an accident why insurance insurance their families won't get the insurance so they are killing themselves and saying you know they've given up on life that you had us has had particular in europe france big agricultural country with still small farmers still having what you're seeing is the corporate takeover of agriculture incidentally it's not privatization it's corporatization farming was always a private sector 
farming is the biggest private sector in your country yeah so all these shibolets and mantras you are told about the glories of privatization the intent is not just to privatize the intent is to corporate like every single airport port in this country is going to be owned by mr radar hmm? so then where is that competition that privatization is supposed to bring it's, it's an absolute figment of i mean it's absolutely a bunch of lies a bunch of lies so yes there have been very high suicides in other countries ours have been incredibly high because of the fragility of the indian peasantry plus all the other things you did to them under the new economic policy the farmer is not just about cultivation she or he has got children to put through school has got an aged parents to look after and feed has got to contend with the creditors and money lenders no longer banks i mean increasingly private things all these pressures put the indian farmer in a pressure cooker situation but don't think it is exclusive to this country no and there are many people give many reasons for the suicide which if you want to can yeah yeah that's a, that's exactly what lakhs of them gathered at the gates of delhi to show you what you could do the one thing that the farmers protest showed us one thing that they taught us is that you can resist you can resist did they succeed in getting them to take back the farm laws kala kanun they got them to withdraw the laws unfortunately that's not a solution to the agrarian crisis but it shows that you can fight back the farmers did your media ever see your media is corporatized totally their editorials were entirely in favor of the farm laws hmm. and no nobody did any one of you your newspaper or your channel website publish the full text of the three law all the great pink papers the business papers did any one of you recall your magazine your newspaper or channel giving those laws are not just about farmers they are huge encroachments on every citizen's fundamental rights in this country there are clauses which take, one of the fundamental clauses of the three laws it places them outside the jurisdiction of the courts you cannot go to court it means annulling one of the most important clauses one of the most important articles of the indian constitution article 32 which is the right the right to legal remedy you have taken away the right of the citizen to go to court damn it look everything that's happening in the courts now the basis of criminal justice is that the state is there to protect the guardian of the interests of the citizen and today the system is on the side of the state against the citizen okay so these farm laws were brought in they forbid they say no suit no prosecution no act shall lie against anyone acting under uh, 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 no prosecution suit shall lie against any against any state government against the central government against any officer of the state government against any officer of the central government hmm. or nor will they lie against any ones else acting under this law in good faith wow immediately i get the names of all those who are operating under good faith i mean i know 
Kavi. Mr. Abbani, Mr. Adani, what? Would they ever act in bad faith? So you've given them immunity from criminal prosecution. You've given them immunity from prosecution in the civil courts. Yeah? That's those farmers fought for you, my friend. They fought for you and me and saved our fundamental rights. Though those laws are not clauses are being introduced in many other sectors. I think that what they went out there was demanding the implementation of the Swaminathan report. Now, I believe that 16 years, 20 years, I was one of the greatest supporters of the report. I participated back, background in its making. But I'm saying now, now we need another commission not controlled by governments. Not con Do you know that in 20 years, there's not uh, 20, 18 years, not one hour's discussion in parliament on any volume of the Swaminathan Commission. I say now, and the farmers, farm unions, are they're talking to them, we need a Kisan Commission or a Kisan Mazdoor Commission where farmers engage on the debate on agriculture themselves and not the think tanks of Monsanto and Cargill and others. That's, that's what I think is needed. Yeah. You know, that entire exaggeration, Sri Lanka's problem came from default in payment. And that idea which he, which that president had of 100% one-time switch to organic, that was pretty stupid. Hmm. It doesn't in any way discredit organic or non-chemical farming. I prefer to call it that. I prefer to not to use the word organic farming because today, Organic farming, 70% of it is controlled by corporations. In the U.S. market, more than 70% of it is coming from corporations. Who, who, according to the legislature of the state they're in, redefine the word organic. Okay? So I tend to keep off from that discussion. But anything else about the suicides, about, yes, yes, Manik. So uh, don't you think this agrarian crisis that you've been talking about is also a crisis that is deeply interlinked to environmental crisis in that sense? Because also uh, when the government also in a Absolutely. way uh, also does a homogenization of crops as well, because there's a recent debate about uh, the cultivation of uh, the growing up of the palm oil that the government has been endorsing uh, lately. And also uh, it has also inevitably led to a loss of crop diversity and uh, monoculture, whether it be the rise in a particular kind of breed, as you were referring to as well, and even say poultry birds as well, and just uh, yeah. which are less resistant to diseases and which was what happened in, uh, I think Pune as well, I think the region as well, when a lot of crops of uh, say uh, cotton as well uh, were affected by ballworm and uh, and led to huge losses to the farmers. Yeah. I couldn't have put it better. That is absolutely correct. Maybe next time we will do a talk on agriculture and agroecology. Agro and uh, the only way for us to go from here is to plan agriculture on the basis of agroecology. There is no other way. There are no options. No? It's either that or perish. Second, you're absolutely right in saying that the impact is devastating monocropping and the kind of technologies used in the cultivation of cash crops are proving deadly, absolutely deadly. Now, by the way, BT guzzles water. It guzzles water. Okay? It was supposed to save water. It guzzles water. You know, it was supposed to do this wonderful thing it was supposed to do was that if you had BT, you won't need uh, you won't need pesticide. Yeah, it's against one pest. Hmm. And since it blanks out everything, all insect 
pollinating everything else in that area what it has given rise to many of the insect life that existed that were predators on insects that destroy your crop the predator species has been destroyed which means millions of white flies all these other things are now free to eat your crop 40% of india's pollinating insect species i mentioned that day before are in steep decline we never understand the importance of bugs in our lives they are not warm furry cuddly creatures they are not labrador puppies you know nothing can make you love a bug right but your life depends on them 70% of the world's food production is dependent on pollinating insects okay. so that's that's another thing uh i maybe next i will show you um, how we created in the groundnut areas of anantapur we created in the heart of the southern peninsula we created a desert it had a distinct impact on climate it had a distinct impact and by the way ordinary people understand this much better than city people do we use the terms temperature weather climate interchangeably they don't they have very specific different meanings to those words in every indian language vatavaran you know havaman tapman they have they understand what the differences are between those words but you are absolutely right the climate crisis is upon us it is devastating agriculture and it's devastating pastoral nomads and devastating fishing fishing communities and by the way in india under the census fisheries also comes under agriculture yeah so then there are yeah any anyone else yeah Uh, Sir, you have been talking about little louder, please. Hello, hello. Sir, you have been talking about the agrarian crisis and how has it devastated the people of many farmers. We had all uh, sessions of parliament fighting over this. We can have one for our farmers. Yeah. 
so you know but the, the thing is when you said agrarian crisis i wanted to say this 30 years ago 25 years ago it was a farm crisis then it became an agrarian crisis i'm telling you this it's long past an agrarian crisis when the largest body of small world that is in india largest body of small farmers who own land the chinese small farmer does not own that land hmm. when they are fighting for survival i would call it a civilizational crisis i also think it's a little more than that we have all stood by and accepted 400000 people taking their lives without exhibiting anything much more than drawing room outrage right so that's the that's the thing i think it's not just a loss of production or a loss of there a diversity or a, i think it also speaks to our loss of humanity that we can remain silent where is our moral outreach this did not happen because of flood or tsunami it happened because we chose a certain bunch of policies which we stick to despite all the evidence of what they have thank you thank you professor sainath for that very engaging very nuanced talk i think what the take away for me at least is that there are these disparate sectors which we have not even begun to scratch which is so interconnected and and deeply interlinked to the farmers press i hope that uh as it it was an eye opening session for all of us it has certainly been for me uh and we hope that we can continue that i think it's it's an unfair responsibility handed over to us that we have to be uh partakers of this problem but since uh it it has been handed us to handed over to us we we need to in, engage with this crisis in our own ways in whatever way we can through our education for skills whatever way that we can um you know afford to in, engage with this issue so with that i think uh, we will have the next round of talks in in january or 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 uh, or february uh, but for now i think i invite all all of you to please thank prasanath with a huge round of applause